So the first thing to start off with, I'm going to share the screen and show some of the PowerPoint that I sent along to everybody. And if you didn't get a copy, just drop some kind of a comment in the chat and I'll uh, make sure that I email you a copy of it. You can email me as well. So I think probably the first thing to learn when you're talking about Geneva is the words, because even at the stage of words, it gets really tricky. So here we can all see the word Geneva actually comes from the French word for juniper, which is Genièvre. And that refers to the juniper berry, which we all know. But the word Geneva refers to the alcoholic drink that we're all going to have a little taste of today. And originally, in the Dutch language, it was spelled with a G sometime around 230 years ago. For reasons no one is very sure, they switched over to doing it with a Y. So if you ask a Dutch person like Odnell, they'll pronounce it Yenever. And of course, with due respect to all my great many friends in England, people in England are not famous for speaking other languages, and they really couldn't say the word Geneva or Geneva, so they kind of mangled it into the word gin, and as we'll see a bit later, they also mangled the product into something completely different. Delicious, but completely different to what we're going to taste today. So Geneva is grain-based spirit. Around the 1400s, it was made with wine, actually. But because of all the war in Europe going on, it became difficult to get hold of wine from Spain or France or even Germany. So it switched over by the 1500s to being based on grain. It can be, just like whiskey, pure pot still, which we call 100% malt wine. Or it can be a blend, just like Scotch whiskey, where you've got pot still and a column still. Obviously, that's a somewhat newer style that came in after 1830, when the column still was uh, patented. It has to have juniper, but it doesn't have to have very much. We'll explain a little later where gin came from, but even the lightest gin you can imagine has 10 or 20 times more juniper than Geneva does. The juniper is just a tiny little accent in the uh, Geneva. And it may have similarly small amounts of other botanicals. Now, originally, it was European botanicals, right? Things that you could find, like coriander, for example, or sage. As the ships that brought back spices and herbs from around the world got faster and faster, they could bring back fresher botanicals. So you started seeing orange peel and lemon peel, and you started seeing crazy things like nutmeg and mace and cloves. At one stage, nutmeg sold for more gram for gram than gold in Europe. So if you put nutmeg in your uh, product, it was very, very boring. You were really, really showing off a lot. Geneva is historically never aged. It was shipped in barrels, but they weren't barrels that were selected to contribute to the flavor. The barrel was a shipping container. Now, though, you can get fantastic aged Genevers. Odds other Geneva, Notaris, is perhaps the best example of that. And aging can really transform a Geneva and make it really, really delicious. So, I don't know if you can see my shitty uh, Google map here, but uh, on the map, these were the regions where you can legally make and sell Geneva and label it in Europe. So there's Holland, of course, also called the Netherlands. There's Belgium, of course, and there's these two regions in France near the Belgian border around the city of Lille called Nord and Pas de Calais. And there's these two regions in Germany, also fairly near the border, called Nordrhein-Westfalia here and Niedersachsen. So to this day, you can legally make and sell Geneva in Europe if it's made in one of those places. So something weird about Geneva is it's different in Holland to the rest of the world. So your Dutch friend is the worst person to ask about Geneva because in Holland, after World War II, they came up with a style of Geneva 
that had so much less malt wine in it. It was 97, 98% neutral alcohol. They even had to give it a new name, new style Geneva or Young Geneva. And this is essentially vodka, really, but it's 98% of all the Geneva that is drunk in Holland. And this young Geneva never really sold a lot outside Holland. In the rest of the world, people who ask for Geneva are expecting to taste something like balls, for example, or uh, notaris, or maybe even some old duff. These are traditional flavored Geneva's. So Geneva's difference in Holland, the young Geneva can even be based on a sugar spirit. And it's usually got no more than 3% malt wine, maybe even 1% or 2%. To give you some idea how neutral it is, I have done tastings with master distillers in Holland who couldn't identify their own young Geneva or tell the difference between different brands. It's really vodka. You know, which, and it's kept a lot of distilleries afloat and alive, so we should be grateful. But it's nice that we're seeing more traditional products coming out now as well. So this book from 1269 is an encyclopedia that mentions the first ever incidents of distilling in Dutch. And it talks about medicine. It says, if you cook rainwater, which is clean, with juniper, you get rid of stomach pain. And if you have stomach cramps, you cook the juniper in wine. So that's it. That's our first reference. It's amazing, but it's medicine. And it's from present day Belgium, what was then part of the Netherlands, and it was around the city of Dom. So this is an encyclopedia that was translated from Latin into Dutch by a guy called Johannes van Merlot. Now in 1552, the Consistent Distillers Handbook was written by Philippus Hermani in Antwerp, and he talked, as I mentioned before, about Geneva Aquavitae, meaning distilled wine with juniper berries, so wine-based Geneva. However, by 30 years later, a book that was published in Leiden, near the airport in Amsterdam, said that grain brandy, which is an old name for Geneva, in aroma and taste is almost the same and is being drunk and paid for. So in just 30 years, the whole industry switched from wine base to grain base because it was just too much trouble doing business with French people or Spanish people. And they were at war all the time as well. Now, if we go back to the country that I'm from, Ireland, Ireland, of course, invented whiskey. You're welcome, world. Thank you. But whiskey, in its early few hundred years, was more like Geneva than anything else. This is just about the oldest recipe that we have for Irish whiskey, Ishkaba. And the recipe is, to every gallon of aqua composita, two ounces of licorice and two ounces of aniseed. And there are other recipes that talk about juniper and coriander and sage and things like that. Because the whiskey, just like Geneva, was not being aged. So you use botanicals to smooth out the raw edges of the flavor and also to make one batch consistent to the next. I like to say that Geneva is what there was before whiskey. Everything else changed, Geneva stayed the same. It's one of the reasons why I love it so much. All right, you gotta let me say this. This is my rant, yeah? So just let me rant. This guy here did not invent gin. He didn't invent Geneva. He didn't work at a distillery. He never distilled anything. Not at all. Never. It's a complete lie. This guy, Franciscus Silvius de Lebo, was a professor at Leiden University, which is great, right? And he was very famous. He corresponded with Sir Isaac Newton in England, the guy who invented gravity. You know, the apple fell on his head. But he never did a single thing with distilling or Geneva or gin or anything. And his name was Franciscus de Lebo. And if your name is de Lebo, it means of the woods. Therefore, your nickname is Silvius. Silvius is a Latin word that means of the woods. So you might hear people tell you that, oh, yes, there was also a Dr. Silvius. No, no, there wasn't. Right? Ah, Regina, welcome, welcome. 
So this guy did not invent gin, did not invent Geneva. As far as we know, he never even drank it, although he probably had some, right? Thank you for allowing me to rant. It never gets uh, old doing this on my uh, PowerPoint. So the first time we see uh, a reference in print in English is in 1623. It's a very bad English joke. As you know, most English jokes are very bad. And this was, if you, you follow me on this, this is how bad the joke was. What the guy is saying here is that military officers get so drunk on Geneva that they can only read Geneva. Geneva was a large print font, a large typesetting. Yeah, I told you it wasn't a very good joke. So what he's saying is it was such a popular drink among soldiers, they would get so drunk on it, they couldn't read normal print and they could only read the big print. This came back to haunt the Geneva industry because when Dutch distilleries started trying to sell their Geneva to English countries and English colonies, they started calling it sometimes Geneva as well. So there are people out there that think that Geneva is made in Switzerland, which is really, really annoying. So, Regina, you've joined us just at the right moment. We're still going through some of the definitions. Geneva became the world's most popular export spirit, right? Ray Charles drank it, and he even drank Geneva every single day, even after he'd given up drinking. And I don't know how you actually manage that, so uh, maybe you can uh, work that out for me. It sold in Africa. It sold in Asia. It sold in South America. In fact, by 1833, there was a brand called Adolphus Wolf that claimed to have sold 45 million bottles all around the world, from Shanghai to Sao Paulo and from New Orleans and New York right the way to the west coast of Africa. 45 million bottles is a lot. In fact, Geneva became so big in Africa, it was adopted into religious rituals. This is uh, a shrine made of Geneva bottles, just like this one, exactly like this one. In Africa, this is not an old photo. They are still building those shrines in Africa. And if you go to the local boss, the chief, if you want to start a business or marry his daughter or get permission to build, you'd better bring a bottle of Geneva. They have really made it all themselves. It's, they, they, they love it so much. And there's even a whole book on the cultural significance of Geneva in Africa written by a professor of anthropology who is the son of a Skidam Geneva distiller. It's, it's remarkable. It's really amazing. So. The three great cities uh, of Geneva were, of course, Schiedam, but very briefly, sorry, I'll go back one, very briefly, Vais, just outside Amsterdam. The reason that Rotterdam moved its distilleries to Schiedam and Amsterdam moved its distilleries to Vais was because distilleries then kept a lot of cows and pigs. They could feed them on the discards and byproducts of distilling and it was a way to make some extra money and even then the cities did not want a lot of cows and pigs in the middle of the city. Vaisp outside Amsterdam only ever had about 20 distilleries. At its peak, Schiedam had 392 working distilleries in 1892, I believe it was, which is ridiculous. That made it probably the biggest distilling city in the entire world. And the population was only 24,000 people then. So this is that brand I mentioned before, probably the best-selling Geneva brand in history. It was founded in 1818 by a German businessman in Hamburg. He bought in Geneva from Skidam and Rotterdam, and his name was Wolf. So he called it Wolf's uh, Geneva or Wolf's Skidam Schnapps or Wolf's aromatic schnapps, or whatever he called it so that someone would buy it. Um, I don't know if you can read the screen, but one of my favorite uh, things is it, it has all these claims. It fixes your mental health, your physical health, and it says it neutralizes the unwholesome effects of drinking water, which I think is a lovely phrase. But back then, of course, 
water was not safe. It really was not safe. So there was something to it. This is an early photograph from 1860 of two riverboat gamblers in New Orleans. And they're showing off all the money they've won gambling, right? One guy's holding the cards, another guy's holding the money, and there's a bottle of Geneva, of Adolphus Wolf Geneva, right in between them. So this is from 140 years ago. It's pretty remarkable. You've probably all read Imbibe by David Wondrich. I hope you have, it's an amazing book. And he updated it a few years recently. And he did some research. In the 1850s, the first golden age of cocktails in New York City, the time of Jerry Thomas and Harry Johnson, for every one bottle of English gin that was imported, they imported 450 bottles of um, Dutch Geneva. Just New York, which is kind of amazing. Believe it or not, Geneva is what cowboys drink in Argentina. There were some hard winters in Holland towards the end of the 1800s, and Dutch people thought they could emigrate and start a new life in Argentina. And it didn't work out very well for a lot of them, but they brought the tradition of drinking Geneva, and it's really cool to go to Buenos Aires. Everything that a cowboy drinks in America, you know there's the theory of the cowboy, he walks into the bar, he says, give me a bottle and, you know, starts drinking shots. Well, that was always whiskey in America, in the Wild West, and it was usually rye whiskey. Well, it's exactly the same in Argentina, except they're drinking Geneva. And they distill their own Geneva there. During World War II, in fact, the Balls Distillery there made all the Geneva that was sold to North America. And there's a famous cocktail book called The Fine Art of Mixing Drinks by David Embury. And he mentions this, and he says that he didn't like the quality of the Argentinian Falls Geneva, and he hoped that they would be able to start importing the, uh, the good stuff from Holland again. So this guy kind of helped start the fall of Geneva. He's another Irishman, and his name was Anus Coffee, and in 1830, he registered the continual still. It wasn't popular in Holland at first, but by 1860, a lot of producers were experimenting with adding neutral alcohol to 100% malt wine to make a blend, the same way they started to experiment in Scotland with single malt whiskey and in other parts of the world. So things were still good. In the late 1800s, 1898, dry vermouth was introduced to America. The Martini Company invented an extra dry vermouth to compete with the French Noi Pra. And it was a huge hit. It was the, you know, the whipped cream vodka of its day. And as if you're a bartender, you know, dry vermouth does not mix well with whiskey and it doesn't mix well with Geneva either. So that was another nail in the coffin of Geneva. But something good happened in 1902. All the distillers got together and decided we want to have a, a, a sort of a quality mark for if you make Geneva the traditional way, 100% malt wine, no sugar, no color, made in an inspected distillery in Holland uh, between 42 and 48%. And what it is, is this, this little seal, little paper seal that goes over the top of a bottle that conforms uh, with that. And this is the equivalent of being, you know, a proper Scotch single malt or whatever. There's only three brands in existence at the moment that carry the seal. There's the Notaris brand, which Odd distills. There's Old Duff, which Odd also distills. And there's the uh, Old Skidam brand, which is distilled in the Geneva Museum in Skidam, and the museum itself is an old distillery, the old Melkers distillery as well. So, World War I, uh, not good. I don't think I need to explain that to everybody. Uh, World War II and Prohibition, also not good. So, by the end of World War II, 
Holland was destroyed, Germany was destroyed, Belgium was destroyed, France was destroyed. And people, much like we are trying to cope now with COVID, just wanted to survive. They wanted to get by day to day and make a little money. So starting in 1952, we saw experiments such as Clairein from Balls that brought the malt wine down from 60% to 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, 3, one percent and in fact in holland at the moment this product here a young style geneva with about one percent malt wine is such a bestseller it outsells all the vodka sold every year in holland so that gives you some idea of how big the uh young geneva category became and in the 70s and 80s Everybody had made money from Young Geneva, but of course, they kind of undercut each other on price. Rather than trying to grow the brand, they would sell it a little cheaper. And then your sales go up for a while. Then someone else sells it a little cheaper than you. And then their sales go up, etc., etc. So the whole industry almost died out. There was almost no distilling left in Holland. Most of the distilleries began buying their malt wine in from distilleries like this uh, beautiful farmhouse distillery called Filiers in Belgium, which is near Ghent. So I've been throwing away a lot of words here, um, but let's talk about how to make Geneva. I'm gonna do the very, very basics, but then I wanna hang o hand over to Odd because Odd actually does it uh, every day or most days. What you're looking at is a bit of a premiere, if you will, it's a recipe that was given to me by the amazing late spirits uh, professor, uh, von Schoenenberger. And I asked him what would be a very, very authentic old school recipe for the 17 or 1800s. He gave me this one. And it's from a book that was published in the south of Holland in 1794 called the, uh, you know, the professional all round uh, brandy and uh, distiller. It might have been written by an actual member of the Balls family. The reason we don't know is back then you wouldn't publish something like this. That was your trade secret. That was your advantage in the world. So what you do is you make 131 liters of what he calls grain brandy, which means a grain distillate. You add in about uh, what would be 12, 15, 14 or 15 pounds of crushed juniper berries that you've soaked them for a while. You add in a spoon of salt and a couple of slices of rye bread. This is a thing you also see with some traditional Eastern European vodka distilling. Maybe you know the brand Green Mark. You put in a handful of hops and you add in about a quarter of a pound of brown syrup for coloring. So that was what Geneva was. And it's very close to a traditional recipe, but it would be hard to make something in even the distilleries we have now. So the basic of making Geneva is making malt wine, and that's straightforward. You ferment a mash. It's usually multi-grain, and most of the mashes contain barley malt, but larger quantities of wheat and corn. You distill it at least three times and a maximum of four times. So Art, I'm going to unmute you, if I may. Uh, would you mind telling us a little bit about your experiences of distilling uh, different malt wines? Because I know that you make lots of different malt wines and uh, you've got different equipment to distill them on as well. Uh, I'm unmuting you. Or I'm trying to unmute you, Art, I'm sorry. Here we go. Yes. I think we uh, we are here. Uh, well, thank you very much, Philip, uh, for your explanations on uh, the history of Geneva and uh, uh, part of the production of it. Uh, I'm happy to, to, to join this meeting. Uh, I just stumbled across it and I thought, well, let's do it. Uh, indeed, we at Herma Janssen, we make uh, this malt wine product like it was very much like it was made in 1902. And uh, uh, let me tell you, this is not an easy, not an easy game. 
it is uh, very labor intensive and uh, uh, needs a lot of uh, attention. Um, uh, I can show you a picture of our distillery if you like, because I can uh, share a screen, I guess. I'm not sure if that will work. Let me see. I think I have a picture later on, actually. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah. I'd have to go out and go back in to fix you. I'm sorry, but I'll show a picture later on. That's fine. Um, uh, we do uh, indeed make the malt wine as is described by uh, Philip in, in these, uh, um, uh, well, six stages actually, uh, four distillations for, to get to the final product. And uh, we, the, the variations between the different styles of malt wine we make are mainly in the mesh bill or in the yeast. Uh, that's, that's, and the distillation techniques, of course. And so we have a lot of um, uh, very, uh, 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 a lot of things we can uh, vary to make different styles of malt wine. We even we even uh, made one with rice, which is totally different again. And uh, uh, the the Duff product is uh, uh, mostly rye, which is uh, for us in our equipment uh, a bit of a hassle to to make a mesh out of that. But we we found a way to do it. It, it, it just asks for totally different uh, temperatures and and times to to get to the fermentable uh, mesh. And uh, well, the traditional mesh bill is, uh, is actually one third of uh, rye, one third of corn, and one third of malted barley, which is the base for the, our uh, Notaris um, Malto in Geneva. That one, yes. Um, well, I'm uh, particularly happy with that one. It was um, uh, blended from various uh, different batches, different uh, 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 ages, and different uh, uh, casks. So it has the, the best of, of a lot of worlds, like the, the, uh, the combination of European and American oak, and uh, the combination of uh, unaged and aged, which gives you the opportunity to have a very uh, fresh and fruity flavor inside, which is also the goal for the Philip Duff uh, Geneva. We uh, uh, selected a yeast that will give uh, a very fruity nose, and I think that is apparent when you uh, when you taste the the Duff Geneva. And uh, you use really traditional equipment, right? I you know also for fermenting. But even for milling us, all the grain is milled in a windmill right outside on a canal. <laughs> uh, ab absolutely true. This windmill is, uh, was built in 1785 and a lot of it is still original and uh, like uh, stairs going, uh, going up in, in, into that mill, which is incredibly high. And I always enjoy taking people from America uh, up to the top of that mill because they get scared stiff. <laughs> <laughs> because this whole thing is trembling and uh, vibrating when it's milling and uh, it's it's quite a scary uh, scary experience and did you mention to me that you also had to temperature control fermentation uh, when you're fermenting rye that that was a really difficult process to master uh, the well the uh, the difficulty is more in in meshing uh, I heard of other uh, uh, distilleries who have a lot of trouble with uh, uh, fermentation of rye mesh uh, with uh, foaming and uh, 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 temperature control to prevent it from foaming over the uh, top of the, of the fermentation vessel. But we have found uh, uh, another way of uh, preventing that by uh, meshing at certain temperatures and times which uh, it breaks down the starches in such a way that the foaming doesn't doesn't happen. So when you've made malt wine, it's really a multi-grain whiskey. Yes, uh, because at that stage there's no uh, botanicals inside yet. The botanicals are typically in the number four distillation. Exactly. So do you want to? I'll uh, put up. Whoops. The next slide which is about adding botanicals to, uh, to make it. So there's two ways to do this, aren't there? You can either add botanicals right into the malt wine and distill it again, 
or depending on what you're making, you can add bot botanicals into neutral alcohol and distill that, right? Yes, that is um, uh, like gin is made, uh, the distilling botanicals on neutral alcohol. For the, your and our uh, brand of Geneva, the botanicals are into the malt wine. Exactly. And have you, obviously you use a wide range of botanicals for all the many, many products you make. Uh, is it difficult to work out how long you have to distill it for or each individual yeah, botanical? We have quite some experience with a lot of gins and uh, uh, we found out that each botanical has its own characteristics. So for a lot of gins, we distill the botanicals uh, single, like one flavor at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, because for certain gins, the combination does, just does, is not, uh, you cannot distill it the combination. Uh, for a lot of botanicals, you need to do them separately. But for Geneva, this is uh, uh, customary to distill all, uh, all botanicals in one go. Exactly, exactly. So we've got all the uh, malt wine, we've got the botanical distillates, and then you can filter it and reduce it, but then you've got 100% malt wine Geneva. There's other types as well. So if you add in neutral alcohol, you're making variously Auda, old style, uh, Corn wine, grain wine Geneva, or you're making Junge Geneva. And the only real difference is the amount of neutral alcohol. So, Gordon Vine, you've all got this in the document that I sent to you, uh, by the way, so I don't think you need to take notes. Uh, you don't see very much Gordon Vine outside of Holland because it's a Dutch treat. And also, Gordon Vine is another difficult word on a label. In fact, when I was helping to develop this brand, Balls, we actually had a debate about putting Cordovine on it because it qualifies as Cordovine. It's got more than 51% malt wine. And eventually we decided, nope, even the word Geneva is already difficult. Uh, we could put Cordovine on this bottle because it's also over 51% malt wine. But nope, it's just too much of a difficult word at the moment. So you can see on the screen all the various minimum and maximum uh, malt wine content. So 100% malt wine has to be 100%. Old style has to be at least 15%. If you drink it in Holland, it's usually 17% malt wine. In export markets, it could be anywhere from 20% to 50% or up. And young style, you really only see in Holland, it's a maximum of 15% malt wine, but it's usually 1% or 2%. You know, uh, Philip, what is the fun part of, of this? Can you go back one slide? Yeah, sure. Well, um, um, you put the 100% malt wine in italic. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, and I understand that completely because uh, in Europe and even in the Netherlands, the 100% malt wine is not uh, defined by any law or regulation. Yep. And that is uh, the big omission, I, I, I guess, in the, in the new uh, legislation that has come up uh, recently. Uh, because 100% malt wine just isn't a product in the, in the European definition, which is a shame, of course. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, today, in this tasting, right, all of us, Carl and Rudy and Regina and Jeremy, we're probably going to drink more 100% malt wine than in Holland, the whole country today. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are, the, the Dutch are always after the cheapest product, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, well, bless them. <laughs> so something that the industry is very proud of is that in 2014, Schiedam Malt Wine Geneva, essentially 100% Geneva made in Schiedam, was put on the UNESCO register of intangible cultural heritage. This is uh, the United States culture, the United Nations Cultural Organization that also regulates things like regional cheese in France and stuff like that. So it's a really big deal. It's now literally part of the history of Holland, this product. So it's something that's uh, very cool. All right, um, we're gonna do a little tasting in a minute. 
if you've got uh, some of the old stuff Geneva, that's great. If you've got any other Geneva, that's great. If you have no Geneva, just grab something and, and join along. I'll try to give some tasting notes on what I've got, and maybe Odd can help us out a little as well. So just in terms of mixology, uh, hands up, just a quick, uh, I'll put my grid out here. Kind of put my grid out. Hands up who's uh, made cocktails with Geneva. Yeah, I think you've got one, Carl, right? <laughs> uh, you should start doing so. Because in in uh, in real life, the Jerry Thomas uh, made a lot of cocktails based on Geneva, back in the in, in the 1860s and and so forth. So uh, the the history of cocktails, uh, well, there's definitely a part of uh, Geneva in there. Yeah, this is it. This is absolutely it. So once you understand and you've tasted Geneva and you know what it tastes like, I think for most mixologists it's easy. You're like, okay. It's sort of whiskey-like, and it's not led by the botanicals, like gin. Normally, if you give somebody a uh, gin, Odd also makes a really great gin called Bobby's, and it's got a lot of lemongrass in it, right? So if you taste it, as a mixologist, you go, okay, cool, lemongrass, I get it. I know what I'm going to do. I might do some Southeast Asian flavors or something to complement the citrus. Boom. But Geneva is so much more about the grain, that it's more important, I think, to know the mash bill and say, okay, there's lots of rye in here. We can work with rye. Or there's lots of wheat in here. That means it's soft and sweet, and I might want to make a slightly more delicate cocktail, if that's the case. So that's my take on uh, how Geneva... Whoops, I've lost everybody on the screen now. On how Geneva mixology works out. And maybe later on in the chat we can... Uh, we can talk about how that all works out. All right, let me see. I just want to put up that slide one more time. There we go. And into the slide show. There we go. Lovely. So a quick word on the Martinez. You all know this cocktail. I think it's the Geneva cocktail. It was first written down in 1883 in Chicago. And it's a reverse uh, Manhattan, as you will. It's the parents of the Manhattan. Twice as much vermouth, sweet vermouth, as Geneva. A tiny bit of maraschino, or if you prefer, curacao liqueur. And a couple of dashes of bokers. If you can't get that, I recommend Ar Angostura Aromatic. It's just a fantastic uh, cocktail to make with a very high malt wine content, Geneva. And of course, the Collins is the cocktail that will get people drinking Geneva who never had any before. Because it was already popular in the 1820s in New York, and they just called it a gin punch, New York style, which meant Geneva lemon sugar, but New York style meant with ice and soda. And a famous theater manager was asked to go to London to run a theater, and he knew the actors, he knew the kings and queens and rich people, and so he became fashionable and this was his drink. They started to make it in London, and the waiter at a men's club in London, Mr. Colin, became famous for making the drink. They called it Mr. Colin's Punch, and eventually they just called it The Collins. And eventually, this being England, they started making it with English gin instead of Dutch Geneva. So if you haven't made a Collins for someone who's never had Geneva, then you, uh, you haven't really lived. So... If anyone's got a question, please throw it in the chat. Oh, there is some questions in the chat. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys. Much appreciated. Uh, maybe since you're professional bartenders, a quick look at a contemporary cocktail. This is a cocktail from my friend Nathan O'Neill at the Nomad in New York. And what he did with this was taste Old Duff Geneva 100% malt wine. And he, he detected like funky aromas there because it's unaged and it's powerful. And he wanted to play off that. So he paired it up with a rye whiskey and an agricole rum. Then he sweetened it a little bit with Oloroso sherry and uh, banana liqueur, because banana liqueur is cool this year. And then he added in a little bit of falernum syrup that he had fat washed with brown butter. All right? So this is a turbocharged, funky, old-fashioned. It's actually one of their best-selling cocktails. 
And it just shows you where somebody who understands the product very well can take a good uh, Geneva. All right. So I've talked for far too long. I think it's time to do uh, the first tasting. Have you all got some Old Duff Geneva? If you have some, pour it out, by all means. Sorry, not available in the Netherlands. <laughs> it, it actually is available now, thankfully. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, not easy to get in the uh, liquor stores, but you can get it online with Drunk Design, Funcinelle. But yeah, <laughs> it was available. It took two years to become available in Holland. That's true. So if you have any. So this is, as you heard Odd describing, two-thirds rye, one-third barley, a five-day fermentation, three times through the pot still, and then the only botanicals are very, very legit ones. English Bramling hops and juniper. So I think this is a real 1700 style of Geneva. And what Odd has done is create something unique as well, because it doesn't taste like Notaro. It doesn't taste like Bald. It's unique, which is, of course, what we wanted. So I'm very grateful to you for all the many, it was two years of hard development and a lot of different uh, uh, test sample bottles that were sent to me here in New York. So I hope you think that it was worth it. <laughs> Absolutely, because we learned how to make a rye mesh, which we did it before. <laughs> yeah, so we look, we look forward to the rye whiskey, uh, Oz. <laughs> <laughs> so for the next one, I'd like to taste Old Duff Geneva the regular one, the green bottle. So this is a different animal. It's the same malt wine, which is to say two thirds rye, one third barley. But this time we have six uh, separate botanicals. We have juniper, orange, lemon, coriander, anise and licorice. And this probably tastes more familiar to you because most of the Geneva in the world is the old style like this. This is a core of vine really, whereby you've got some neutral alcohol as well. Well, we get some nice uh, uh, reviews here. Yeah, people, um, they always pick a favorite. They always pick, they either love the 100% malt wine or they love this. This is the one that won a double gold at the San Francisco Spirits Competition. Oh, but good. this won the gold medal at the World Spirits Awards. So. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, I think th these products also v stand out really well in uh, various cocktails. And uh, uh, that is, I think, a very strong point for any product sold in the United States. Yeah, and it's, it's really what they were designed for. And this one, if you don't have any in front of you to taste, it's definitely in the same family. It's a little more approachable. The aroma comes up faster because it's lower in alcohol. It's 40% alcohol. But you've got more citrus, obviously. And right at the end, you've got this sweetness from the star anise and the licorice. And that's really very pleasant. Mm. Hey, Alts, I've got a little bit of this. I don't. I think it's just you and me. But my but, is empty, so I, I envy you. Oh, all right. Well, I don't know. Could you talk us through a tasting of it? Or tell us a little bit about how it's made? Yeah, well, I, I explained uh, most of it already, I guess. Um, the mesh blow I explained. Uh, the yeast in this case is uh, the simple baker's yeast, which is not often used for a spirit drink, but it's like a historical uh, base. Eh? The, the, the baker's yeast used to be the normal yeast for, uh, for Geneva uh, 100 years ago. And it is indeed like uh, the Duff Geneva, it's uh, pot still distilled three times to make the, the malt spirit and then an extra distillation for uh, the botanicals. Um, and specific about this product is uh, the, the, uh, the combination of unaged rye together with uh, aged um, uh, on American oak and um, aged on European oak. And this combination and uh, is uh, something you can only do with a blend. Uh, normally, a blend is not regarded as uh, better, but in this case it is because you get best of both worlds. 
I'm uh, very happy with this pro product and uh, I hope uh, we can have some uh, uh, awards with this as well. We, we will definitely uh, uh, enter it in some uh, contest. Uh, and it was actually created uh, with the input of uh, six bartenders from Italy, wasn't it? So it really yes, is the bartender's yes. choice. Yes, there's, there's 10 years old, there's 15 years old, and there's unaged inside that one bottle. Yeah, no, it's a remarkable Geneva. So just moving on, whoops. Uh, you probably all know Balls, or as the project was actually called Balls 1820. So this is an old Geneva from the Balls company. They buy in the malt wine from Filiers in Belgium, and they add neutral alcohol to it and uh, they've got the, they buy in the botanicals too and they bottle it. And it's a, it's a little more complex. It's definitely a different taste. So I was happy enough to be involved in uh, creating this brand more than 10 years ago, actually. And this is probably the most widespread one that you'll see. It's got, uh, this particular one is barrel aged. So it tastes a little different to the one up there. Now, it looks like I put the recipe up there, but I couldn't possibly tell you the recipe because that would not be a very nice thing to do. So let's just say that that's my best guess. So you've got a lot of similar things like juniper, coriander, two types of orange, but you've also got caraway and uh, angelica as well. You've got hops and a bit of gentian and a bit of ginger. So when you nose it, when you nose balls, it's kind of got an aniseed aroma to it. And that's from how they distill the rye portion of the malt wine. And when myself and Odd were developing Old Dove, I actually asked them, can we make something that doesn't have that aroma? Because, you know, you make your own brand, it has to taste different. So it's very much, this will be what most people around the world uh, think is Geneva. If they have a bottle, it will probably be that one. And, uh, it'll be a flavor that's uh, accessible to them. And just like my one, Odd, for two or three years after this was launched uh, worldwide, first in America, it wasn't available in Holland either. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you get all the good stuff. Yeah, everyone wants America. Um, I'm a bit embarrassed. This is a young Geneva from our friends at Bonesma, but I don't have any young Geneva in my house at all. So no tasting there. Uh, if you want to know what Young Geneva tastes like, get a vodka, and it's it's really pretty much the same, right? Although I will say, uh, have you ever tasted Filiers Young Geneva, Odd? Uh, yes, uh, I do have some samples of that, of various ages as well, because they age it. And we, we do buy uh, the malt spirit from Filiers for um, uh, more like mainstream uh, Genevas, because, yeah. uh, because this... What we make in-house is um, really for uh, the top of the range, like the notaries and, and the, the Duff Geneva. And uh, we don't make it for anybody else. So yeah. uh, but we do make a lot of other Genevas. And, and for this uh, uh, range, we buy the malt spirit from Phileas. Yeah, so I bring it up. If you ever fly into uh, Brussels Airport, they have the best Geneva duty-free in the world, I think. And the Filiers Young Geneva, I think, really has 14% malt wine. It's right at the limit. And I think it's the best one I've ever had. So uh, maybe one more just before we finish. You might recognize uh, this brand. This is Rutta from the De Kuiper Company. They uh, promote this a lot in England, in America. And it's uh, a, a sort of a hybrid. They buy in the malt wine from Filiers and they do their own botanical distillation. Then they add the neutral alcohol and all that. And this is their brand called Old Simon, after Simon Rutter, who was one of the founders. He wasn't the, the, the very first founder. And I always say, if, uh, if Old Duff is like Old Overholt, you know, it's the rye whiskey, it's powerful, it's delicious. And this is like Old Forester, maybe. Then Rutter is sort of like famous grouse scotch. It's sweet and honeyed and light. 
and they've got um, a particular botanical in it. Oh, what is it? Uh, Johannes uh, Vruchten. Um, what's the phrase? What's what is it? Odd. Oh, it's like the fake chocolate one. Well, I'm not so sure. <laughs> oh, does it actually say it on the label? I don't have to. Oh, yeah, it. I got it. Carob. Sorry. Carob. A, a carob in English. In Dutch, it's something like Johannes Vruchten or so it's. But um. One of the key ingredients in this is carob. And if you've never had carob, it's sort of uh, reminiscent of cacao, but it's, I think, a lot less expensive. And it gives you this kind of round, almost chocolatey flavor when you taste uh, the rosa. And it's also very nice to eat. Hmm. <laughs> Definitely. A little bit lower in alcohol, but that's how they roll there. So, all right. So questions. Thank you, um, Everybody, thank you. Uh, so, Rudy, you got a question. Uh, <laughs> I won't reply to your comment, Carl, but I probably agree. Uh, <laughs> Rudy asked, if I was to be offensively simplistic, could you describe Geneva as almost half a light gin and half an unaged whiskey? Well, you're definitely on the right track there. You are. And um, the problem is, I didn't explain this, even though I promised it. For a lot of reasons, including getting a Dutch king, in England, they started to try to make Geneva. They couldn't say the word Geneva, so they mangled it and turned it into gin, but they also couldn't make Geneva. They didn't have the expertise. To make stuff like these, you've got to be able to make good whiskey. And at the time, the only place in the English empire that could make good whiskey was their colonies of Scotland and Ireland. And those places were more dangerous then than Afghanistan is now. So in, in and around London, there really weren't good distillers. There were distillers. They couldn't make the malt wine. It tasted horrible. So instead, they put in 20 times the juniper. And they put in sugar as well. And after 1830, when you could make neutral alcohol, they started using neutral alcohol instead of the whiskey-like base. So you are right to say that there's some kind of a relationship there. And I always like to say, if you like whiskey, you're probably going to appreciate Geneva more than if you like gin, because it's such a big difference, such a big, big difference uh, between the two. So a couple of questions coming in from Carl as well. Um, just a word, though, on Rudy's question, if I can go back to it. And when we came down to, I was part of the tasting panel that developed bonds. And we had what was called triangle tasting. Everyone on the team has to taste three samples. Two are the same and one is different. And you have to say which is the right one or what you like or whatever. And I was traveling a lot, 30 countries a year. And I came to the office on Friday at five o'clock and it was Holland. So everyone had gone home three hours before. And I tasted my, my samples and I wrote my note. And on Monday, I was back in the office and I was the last person to taste. So I wanted to know what's the overall choice, which sample did we choose? And my colleague said, well, it was unanimous. Everyone chose this one. And everyone hated the other one. And the other one had more juniper in it. With Geneva, more juniper is usually worse. And with gin, more juniper is usually better. Like, I really love the Sipsmith, very juniper uh, old uh, thing. I mean, odds, you make a lot of gins. You see a lot of gins. Is anyone doing very heavy juniper gin in Holland? Um, uh, nowadays, we get more uh, requests for gin uh, with juniper as... Uh, well, not the most important flavor. Yeah. This is quite uh, the thing nowadays. And um, one of our brands, the Bobby brand, is also like that. You know, it, it's, I think it's called the new Western style or uh, anything like that. But the, the, the traditional gins with um, juniper as the, uh, really the main on top of everything flavor is, uh, is not big. But what's something, maybe it's nice uh, to tell everybody, 
I moved to Holland in 1995 and I opened Door 74, my cocktail bar in Amsterdam in 2009. And I remember in like 2007, I looked at the list of the best selling categories of spirits in Holland. By the way, Carl, I'm going to answer your question, buddy. I just want to finish on the same. Uh, I looked at the, the 10 best selling categories, you know, and uh, number one was Young Geneva. Number two was actually rum. Holland is a big country for Bacardi. Number three was whiskey. All the way down, I think number 20 was actually gin. Gin, as a category in Holland, sold less every year than Advocat, the eggnog that they make in Holland. So it's changed a lot recently, but gin drinking in Holland, like real gin drinking, is quite recent, isn't it, Ad? Absolutely. It, uh, uh, I saw it booming. Uh, we, we handled quite a lot of uh, requests uh, uh, for new gin and, well, you, you see them coming and going, uh, but it, it's, still, it's still rising, I guess. There's still requests for new types of gin. The, the end is not in sight. Oh yeah, the boom hasn't even started here in America. I can, I can guarantee that. 